So this is the American Heart Association 2020 uh, return of spontaneous circulation algorithm. So at the very top here, you can see ROSC is obtained. After that, uh, management of the airway, which that may already be done. Uh, likely, it's probably already done. We either have an endotracheal tube in place or we have a superglottic airway, either a king or an eye gel in place uh, or an LMA, depending on where you work. Uh, manage respiratory parameters. So start at 10 breaths per minute. We're trying to titrate that uh, pulse oximetry somewhere between 92 and 98 percent and our end tidal CO2 somewhere between 35 and 45. That is a normal range for end tidal CO2. Manage hemodynamic parameters. So systolic blood pressure greater than 90 is what we're trying to get. Uh, and then a mean arterial pressure of greater than 65. So in a previous lecture, I talked about MAP. Uh, when you take a blood pressure, especially via a cardiac monitor, you get the systolic number, you get the diastolic number, and then you're given a little um, two-digit number, kind of much smaller font uh, size next to the systolic and diastolic numbers. That is your MAP. So you double your diastolic, add your systolic, and then divide by three. And whatever that number is, um, generally, we want that to be somewhere between uh, like 70 and, and 110 or 75 and, and 95. It just depends on what text you read. Uh, but we, we really want a good map at greater than 65 when we get a return of spontaneous circulation. Next is obtaining a 12 lead ECG. So uh, we're not at this point, we're probably not entirely sure why the patient was in cardiac arrest, uh, but obtaining a 12 lead ECG. Uh, and even as, a, as an EMT basic, we can go ahead and put the electrodes on, right? We can get the 10 stickers on. We might not be interpreting it, but we can go ahead and do that for ALS uh, because we want to see, is this patient having an MI? Um, if they are having an MI, um, we might have to pass up a, a um, closer destination facility to go to a cardiac capable facility um, a few minutes further down the road so that they can go to the cath lab. Uh, this patient, if, depending on how long they had CPR done on them, they're probably going to have some cardiac damage and, and blood work. Their troponin levels are probably going to show that uh, because we've been we've been pumping on their chest for X amount of time. Mm -hmm. uh, consider for emergent cardiac intervention if we have a STEMI. So obviously, like I just spoke about, we would get that from the 12 lead EKG. We have unstable cardiogenic shock, uh, which essentially means the uh, it's not a fluid problem. Uh, so we have enough volume, we have enough fluid circulating, the patient isn't bleeding out, or at least we don't suspect that. Uh, the patient uh, isn't in any type of crazy cardiac dysrhythmia. They don't have any other type of shock going on, like a septic shock or an anaphylactic shock. Once we've rolled out all of those things, if the patient's heart still isn't beating as well as it needs to be, they're still hypotensive, we can start to kind of lean on, ah, I wonder if this patient's in cardiogenic shock. Now, the number one cause of cardiogenic shock is a, a myocardial infarction. If a myocardial infarction isn't treated and isn't addressed early on, that is eventually going to go into a cardiogenic shock and then eventually death. So essentially what cardiogenic shock is, is the it's a pump problem. The pump or the heart isn't doing its job like it needs to. Uh, so therefore the patient is becoming more and more hypotensive. Vital organs are becoming less and less perfused. Um, do they follow commands? So if yes, they follow commands, and the patient's awake, uh, we're going to continue to to monitor those patients, continue to get blood pressures from an ALS perspective. We're going to continue to monitor EKG. Uh, we're going to have a line established or, or establish a line if we haven't already done that, give some fluids, potentially some vasopressors, depending on what their blood pressure looks like and so forth. If the patient does not follow commands and they are still comatose, which is probably the most likely scenario of ROSC, uh, targeted temperature management is on this. Um, AHA and ACLS does talk about targeted temperature management, and I talk about it on the next slide as well. Um, that is does not necessarily apply to the pre-hospital setting. Um, and if you read the literature of the American Heart Association, ACLS, Temperature targeted management is mentioned in there, but that's more so for the for the, uh, the in-hospital or the clinical setting because they have a much better ability to monitor core body temperature than what we do in the field. Um, so your protocols may speak to starting targeted temperature management with like ice packs in the armpit and groin. Uh, if they do, that's fine. Again, uh, I've said this in uh, almost every other lecture that I've done this far, you have to follow your protocol at the end of the day, uh, but just know from an American Heart Association, they don't necessarily expect EMS providers to, to uh, perform targeted temperature management because we don't have a fantastic way of actually monitoring it. 
obtaining a brain CT, obviously that's not going to be something that we do in the field. Uh, but essentially what they're looking for there is, uh, is any type of brain bleed or injury to the brain. Um, another critical care management. So just definitive um, and the care and definitive management in the hospital, uh, you know, eventually be either going to the cath lab or going to the ICU, whatever it may be for continuous observation, blood work, EKG monitoring, and so forth. So the initial stabilization phase, and we're kind of jumping back to this second um, large green square on that algorithm. 